Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and today we are looking at this incredible Sunbeam Mark III. Of course it came from the Sunbeam Talbot 90 which came to market in I believe 1948. So this is a car with quite some heritage and if you're a Sterling Moss fan you probably know an awful lot already. But with this being quite a lesser spotted car I wanted to get into a bit of the nitty gritty with you along with a good walk round and a little bit of history as well about this particular car. But before we get into any of that let's kick off with a message about our channel sponsor. Life is too short to drive something boring. So if you're looking for your first classic or your next classic, why not check out Bidding Classics Auctions? Whether it's something pre-war, mid-century, or maybe something newer like a retro hot hatchback, check out their website. There's a link in the description box below, or you can Google Bidding Classics Auctions. There's new stuff going on the website every single week. So why not check them out? Now let's go back to the video. Whilst this is a car sold in the mid-1950s, the story of the Sunbeam Mark III begins with the 90 range, which was unveiled at the Earls Court Motor Show of 1948. They even featured a cutaway model to show how everything worked, which is actually still in existence and features in my recent video of the trip to the Isle of Man Motor Museum, where it's on display. Now I do know that the 80 launched alongside the 90, but today's video focuses solely on the 90. For reference, the 80 was dropped in 1950 to concentrate on the Sunbeam Talbot 90, which is why you so rarely hear about them. Now the 90 was a car which heralded a new dawn for both Sunbeam Talbot and for Roots Group. The car was for its time, styled in a modern manner. It had an overhead valve engine, in a world that, where that was quite modern thinking because some manufacturers wouldn't catch on to that for another decade due to things like budgeting and resource constraints. And although we talk about this new dawn, it's worth mentioning that the mechanical bits and pieces for the 80 and the 90 were both loosely derived from the Talbot 10 and the two litre models. The car when it came to market was marketed as a respectable sports car for the family man the bank manager with flair or a sporting saloon for a motorist with good taste and was set up to run as such because by the Mark III as we test here today the 2267cc engine was fitted offering over 90 miles per hour as a top speed which was nothing to be sniffed at. And speaking of motorists with good taste the Sunbeam Talbot 90 the 2A variant was what Sterling Moss used in his rallying pursuits. It was a success from the outset for Sterling and in the first instance the competition offered Moss 50 quid and he came second in the 1952 Monte Carlo rally which is nothing to be sniffed at. And something they got so right with the 90 is that they never rested on success. The Mark 1 was replaced by the Mark 2 just two years into production and the engine was whipped up into the 2267cc engine which we've got here today. You see the chassis stiffened with cruciform bracing and the front suspension is then made independent. And it's worth mentioning that these aren't small changes and they aren't cheap. These were big investments going into the car. Root saw this as a car which was taking them into the future. So more changes appear again later in 1952 and you see the 2A coming to market. So it's got improved steering and it's got larger drum brakes. And then in mid-1953, you see the final car, which is the Mark III. And they go at it again power-wise because they bring in a high compression cylinder head, which is what we've got on this car. But weirdly, just after the launch, it's around the early 1954 mark, they drop the Talbot name. So then you just see it called the Sunbeam Mark III, not the Sunbeam Talbot 90 Mark III, which is sometimes what people call it. And there are some rare examples out there with floor change, which might confuse you if you see them at car shows, but they were actually column change as standard. And so it's just a limited run of, I think, 30 cars which were fitted with that floor change. Now they kept things very neat and tidy and in 1957, before all the hype is over and whilst opinion is still high, they bring the car to a respectable close and they then replace it with the far more modern looking Sunbeam Rapier. It's a well thought of classic car then and now, even though it's not one that you see regularly. But again, just like the Sunbeam that we're testing today, the Rapier again is so rarely spotted. So it seems like a real privilege to show you this today. 
We've tested quite a lot lately from the golden age of motoring. We did the standard Vanguard, we did the Jowett Javelin, and now we're doing this incredible car. And in fact, mentioning that Jowett Javelin is quite relevant because if you had a pot of money, this was roughly in that same competing space, money-wise, because the Jowett Javelin, including sales tax, was 1,200. And this for 1955, which apologies, was the closest I could get it for working out price comparison, was 1,191 pounds, including sales tax. So there was only nine pounds difference. So if you're watching this and you're comparing it in terms of value for money, it's not a bad shout. But coming inside here, it feels very traditional. It feels older than its time, but I'm not entirely surprised because when the Sunbeam, Sunbeam Talbot 90 came to market, and I think it debuted at the 1948 Earls Court Motor Show, which was a very good year, um, it was quite a new design. But by this point, 1957, Motoring moved on quite quickly in a way that I don't think we see so much nowadays. So by this point, 1957, and it's about to be shelved for that Sunbeam Rapier, it does feel like a dated design. There's a few bits though, that if you are a bit of a Sunbeam Talbot 90 fanatic, you'll know that are missing or upgraded from the Mark 1 and even the Mark 2. Because the greatest thing about going for a car that's at the end of its production is that they do start to wheedle out some of those earlier problems. Now the great thing about Sunbeam Talbot was they immediately started thinking about what to do next right from the Mark 1s. Sometimes you see cars and they don't make any changes throughout production and by that point they do feel dated. But to say this feels dated and not really talk about the improvements they made through the production would be I think quite irresponsible when you're talking about the vehicle. So the Mark 2s when they came out were probably you saw your biggest jump because they'd done things like more effective cooling that's why you see and in fact this is something for the mark three you know those chrome cut out holes on the bonnet that you might have seen earlier they were actually just they kept having to improve the cooling because those early mark ones were quite prone to overheating and in fact practical classics said when you they did a buying guide to these in the 1980s and they actually said by your mark three the gearbox i think they say is the weakest point but even then that's not really that weak and they actually describe them as having real no real mechanical weaknesses I mean what a strong accolade for a car so let's talk about what we've got in terms of inside the dash and the first thing that I'm going to tell you is and a lot of you will be watching is has it got the overdrive because the Laycock overdrive was a very popular upgrade for these at the time but this is just your bog standard. There's nothing additional inside. Now, the glove box is a nice big size here. We've got a few bits inside. But as you can see, you've got plenty of room. Now, it's worth saying that this is quite a regularly used vehicle, which I absolutely love. In the summer, Peter has this out all the time. And in fact, I met Peter at a car show um, and we were talking about the car. And this is the great thing about this car is it spent so much of its life hidden away in a garage, not really being used, being used sparingly that now in her twilight years, she's actually being used and enjoyed as she well should be. So up here, you have just this panel here, which is a bit of a, just a blank area that Peter uses to put his sunglasses in and other bits and pieces. Coming down from there, you've got this attractive S for sunbeam in the center. If you're wondering what's missing, because quite often they put things like this in here, it's missing a rev counter. That's what you could have had put in. Over to the left-hand side, you've got your panel lights. Coming down from there, this is the ejector switch. No, I'm joking. This is actually your, your ignition light, it's quite big. Coming into the center here, you've got your side and headlights and you put your key in the center there. Up here, you've got your choke and down here is your push start. Coming down from there, you've got your windscreen washer and then coming down from there, you've got your heater controls. We're gonna see how good these are today because Look at all the rain. The screen is all steamed up. So we're going to have to get that cleared before we go out for a drive. Over to the left-hand side, you've got a little switch for fan. And over to the right-hand side, you've got this little switch for light. Now, you might be thinking that that is to do with the main headlights or to do the panel light but actually it produces and sadly because we're not in the dark we can't show you very well but it's it turns on a little red light behind the heater panel to give it a feel of warmth which it's one of those natty little extras that I think is quite cool, actually. Now, coming in front of us, 
you've got your petrol gauge, you've got your temperature gauge, speedo to centre there. And by the way, if you're looking at that mileage and thinking, surely that's not less than 40,000 miles from you, it is indeed. What an incredible car. I mean, do you not think, going slightly off piste, that the leather on these seats really shows that the car hasn't been used? They are in such good condition. I think people would have been overjoyed to have found a car that was in this nice condition in the 1980s, let alone being in the 2020s. I mean, this old girl is 66 this year, which is quite an incredible feat that she's made it this far. Over on the right hand side there, you've got your amateur and you've also got the oil pressure. You've got everything on this. And just coming down from there, you've got your wipers. And there's something that does need to be mentioned because I've said that the car's quite antiquated and I don't want to do her any injustice, is you do have twin speed wipers on this, which let's face it, we had cars that were coming out in the 1970s, like the Marina, that still didn't have double speed as standard. So it is worth mentioning. Now coming down from there, you see this B, as you'd expect, it's for the bonnet. Now you have got your sunshine roof up here with this, which you pull back. But look, look at the weather today. I'm not going to be pulling that back because what if I can't get it shot or all that rain comes in and flattens my hair. And coming up here, one of my last things that I'm going to mention is the clock. So you've got a nice little clock up there as well. I think the design on this is just so pleasingly put together. Even the control that you pull back to open the door. Everything is so thoughtfully put together. It's the kind of stuff that you saw on those 40s cars when you bought a car for life or you bought a car and it was a massive investment because even by this point in the 50s, um, going into the early 60s, cars start to become a little bit more disposable. So it's actually quite refreshing to see a car in the late 50s that almost does feel like one of those cars where it is a car for life. And the last thing that I'm going to mention before I demonstrate the gear change for you is you probably noticed at home, because I know you're all very eagle-eyed, that it's got four pedals on the floor. So you know some, you've got the dip switch, which occasionally you see is a very small little button up, up here usually. This has got a whole pedal for it, so I'm going to be really careful where I rest my feet when I'm driving and I've not got a foot on the clutch. But that's pretty much everything in a nutshell that we've got inside here. Um, let's get her started up. I want you to hear how she sounds. For me, this is quite a pleasing little engine. Have a listen. She's warmed up, so we're not gonna need that choke. Good luck, Bev. Can maybe do a tiny bit, just a tad. Sometimes getting the choke right on these, or really any old car, is almost like making a cake. You could get the recipe just right. Yeah, there we go. adventure begins. into fours but I'm going to drop back into third there just because we're climbing around these bends. We're filming just outside Saddleworth for anyone who wanted to know where we were. People always ask where we've been out on our adventures. Now this is a great little car. Now we talked about it being the 2267cc engine. A lot of people call it the two and a quarter and it's got quite a good bit of performance. I think zero to 60 is, get those off, 
0 to 60 is just over 17 seconds. It's got a top speed of just over 93 miles per hour. And I think I was reading it's got 77 brake horsepower. So it's not a slow engine and therefore, well it's not a slow car. And therefore for me, it makes it a contender for one of those cars that you can use quite regularly. I'm sure you can see as we whip round these bends that it's keeping up with the modern traffic with really no trouble whatsoever. But what is she like to drive? Well, the first thing I'll say is, is I've tested quite a lot quite recently with different column change. And so that puts me in a really enviable position to be able to draw quite some quite fair conclusions. Now this for me has probably got one of the smoothest that I've tested. It's a really pleasing column change on this and it's very easy to get your head around. Some of them you get in and they feel quite clunky, especially when it's you know last year of production and they've been running with the same sort of setup for quite some time. She sings along the road, which is quite nice. And for me, this is quite a true test drive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, eagle eye viewers at home will have noticed we're not running on radials, we're running on cross plies, which is what it would have been sold on. So therefore, we get a much truer driving experience with under 40,000 miles on the clock. And it being a car that's been very well cared for, and you can really tell that, by the way, it feels as close to original and as close to new as possible. So we get a good understanding of what it must have been like to drive as maybe the second or third owner or when it was quite new. And as we come along, you'll be able to feel that the roads of Great Britain today are not amazing, but it's taking all the bumps and potholes in its stride. She's cruising along and the steering is quite light. Peter, the owner, had warned me to Steph, I think you might find it's quite heavy. Not so. I don't think actually it's that heavy at all. It's in terms of comparing it to other stuff from the era it's actually quite light and as you can see as i come around this corner and i only move that steering wheel oh so slightly she follows the road with ease i can see why these were taken out rallying it's a very comfortable position it's got the armrests that i love so much and it those chairs you probably would have noticed that they're quite upright it feels like sitting in quite a comfortable sitting room chair so your position is set it's all very comfortable the one thing that I will say that might detract from the enjoyment for someone of a larger stature either girth wise or maybe even tall um, is that it's quite a not cramped area here but it's quite a compact space here so if you like a lot of space around you as you drive you might find that this is a little bit claustrophobic for you but for me it hits the mark completely and you might have noticed as well that if you are carrying passengers although the car is just over 14 feet long there isn't actually that much leg room in the back but hey I'm the driver I don't care what's happening in the back for me the enjoyment comes from being in the driver's seat now, the one thing I will say as well is being sure is sometimes I get into vehicles and everything feels like the bonnet you can't see the end of it or things are just feels like you feel a bit too short for the experience this today because I've been able to bring the seat forward I'm able to see to the end of the bonnet which gives me great driving confidence and I'm able to see those mirrors as well you've got a good size back screen so I can see out the back as well and you've got this lovely big front screen which means that your visibility is enhanced everything about this car feels like it's been and i've talked a lot about this recently that some vehicle manufacturers get this right some don't design with the driver in mind it's a driver's car it's really pleasing the other thing that i've had to get my head around is that the accelerator is slightly offset right over into this corner to the point where my foot is touching both the door and uh, the well the wing and the pedal which does feel slightly strange but I think well you could probably get your head into that with not too much effort now what I would have loved to have done today is taken her through the Alps or taken her through great big mountains and driven her at some speed with gusto because you can feel even now at 66 that's not how she not only how she deserves to be driven but you can feel it's in her that's how she wants to be driven this has been such a lovely drive. I know the scenery hasn't been as picturesque as some of the drives we've been on, but my goodness, what a car and 
what a privilege to be able to drive such a great example. So thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much to you at home for watching as well. So until next Sunday, when we come back together once again, and we're driving something, again, very, very different indeed. Take care and drive safely. Thank you.